So thank you for joining the Wild and Precious Life series. I am very excited to introduce our first poet of the evening, Lisa Hayes Jackson. And Lisa, I am going to take you back to an interview that you actually did for Converse. Um, and you were asked in this interview, can you talk a little about how a sense of place informs your writing? Is place what inspires you as a writer? And I couldn't, I just couldn't take an excerpt of it. So I'm going to share everything that you said because I just, I loved everything that you said. So everybody buckle up. It's a little longer of an intro, but you know, when it's your series, you get to do what you fucking want to do. And this is what I'm doing. So hope you enjoy because I really love what Lisa had to say. Whether consciously or not, we're constantly taking stock of our surroundings and are likewise influenced by them. Gravity and temperature, for example, continuously affect us just as light does light, sound, and the millions of atoms that we perpetually exchange with the world around us. All this contributes to our mood, our perceptions, and even our psychological state of being. We do not exist outside of place and neither does poetry. Writing about place helps me to connect with reality and often to self. I think it's difficult to immediately relate to other people, especially when new to town, but connecting to an environment, even when it's very unfamiliar, is much more direct. I can get to know a geography or a building through firsthand experience and a little research, which is less the case with people. I've also noticed that arriving in a new place provides different perspectives on places I've lived before, so that even while living among the stunning mesas and mountains of New Mexico, I came to admire the subtle beauty of the Kansas prairie. And just as living now among cypress swamps, wetlands, and the Atlantic coast that rise Charleston, my appreciation for the stark and ever-changing color palette of the desert has deepened. I can, I'm always excited by vocabulary too, and becoming familiar with new terms and topography they symbolize helps me gain a sense of belonging. Invariably, these terms make their way into my poetry. So yes, I do find quite a lot of inspiration in place. Thank you for being here tonight. The screen is yours. Thank you so much, Dustin. Um, that was very nice. I, I forgot about that interview. Um, I, I don't have my book with me, so I'm gonna real quick, there's the cover of my book as my, as my picture for a second there. Um, and then, um, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. And then also I am in a neighborhood and there are some things happening behind me. I'm hoping that for the next 15 minutes, everybody's relatively calm and quiet, especially the canine folks in our neighborhood. Um, as I'd mentioned to Dustin at the beginning of um, when we were all logging on and getting to you know, say hi to each other is that my daughter is in the hospital right now um, having a baby. So I would like to start off my reading with uh, a poem that is dedicated to my daughter and it's in my first book, Flint and Fire. Letter to my daughter. It was the kind of idyllic day that makes you think you figured something out about life that makes you believe that from here on out, life will be smooth sailing, or if not smooth sailing, at least a little easier, the answers a little more obvious than they've been so far. We spent the day fishing ponds on your grandparents' property. Friends with two children of their own had joined us. Your brother, a little more than two, played hard and grew tired. And though your father drank, it wasn't much, his speech not too slurred. I spent the day reading in the sun on an old quilt spread out on muddy banks, shoes just off to the corner. The sun pinked my skin beneath sunscreen, the breeze tangled fine hair that you and I share. Dinner arranged itself around bass and catfish fried with Inslee's batter, new potatoes from the young garden creamed with spring peas, a leftover cucumber salad. We unloaded fishing rods and tackle, the twitching stringed fish from the bed of the truck. Standing at the kitchen window, watching your father clean fish, my water broke. Our friend grabbed several towels from the upstairs bathroom, then wished us luck over her shoulder as she packed up her family and headed home. 
You arrived later, of course, just as the sun rose above St. Francis. Um, and here is a, <clears throat> here's an old poem about my current husband about a time before we were married, moon bath. After our moonlit walk with my now sleeping daughter, I lie soaking in the tub, whispers of warm water tease the backs of my knees and neck, ease tension from my shoulders. A soapy pool forms in my shallow navel. I hear rustling as you read in bed and enjoy our brand of quiet. When I ask you through the open door, what is the opposite of misogyny? Anti-misogyny? You come and sit on the side of the tub, dip your fingers into the bath and read aloud to me from your book. Lost in your plot, I'm careful not to splash. This is a, a new poem that was actually inspired the last time I was up at Converse. Insomnia in another town or ode to quick trip. One, who knows why? Excitement, boredom, the flashing pen light from the ceiling smoke detector piercing the darkness eyelids. A small town too. No walking downstairs to a bustling body of people. No late night cafes or open bars. Last call hours ago. All night grocery stores, a casualty of the pandemic they say. But there's a convenience store three minutes near. A quick trip to be exact. Always clean, well lit with an abundance of processed manna. Two, the store looks dim in contrast to the bright can canopy above vehicles, gas pumps standing witness to the night. The pavement shimmers, the air drips, vestiges of a recent storm common to hurricane season. Three, Bratwurst, taquitos turn on stainless steel rollers beneath heat lamps. The donut case is stocked like never before. Personal sized frozen pizzas and hamburgers wrapped in cellophane wait near the microwave. Deli sandwiches and processed lunch meat and cheese packaged with Oreos watch from the shelf above an open cooler. Four, the clerk bubbles with 2 a.m. smiles that would be annoying at seven in the morning, but is welcome, is welcome right now above this cache of late midnight snacks, a lullaby of carbs to soothe excitement, boredom, dim the red pin light of the ceiling smoke detector. I, I told Gary that I was gonna read some, a couple poems that I don't usually read. Here's one of them, Semester. I love that our clothes are strewn across the bedroom floor, the couch, love to use the word strewn. This morning it rained. We made cinnamon French toast with eggs and strips of crisp uncured bacon, made love on full stomachs, twisting sheets twisted from sleep in our own unmaking. It is Sunday, it is midterms. Clothes will remain strewn across the house until after finals or at least Thanksgiving break when we'll clean house for friends who come for dinner of turkey, green beans, sweet potatoes, pumpkin pie, who'll bring whipped cream in a can and will search for clothes that have since been thrust into closets behind promises that we will catch up once we are happy, once we are sated and clothed. I have just a couple more here. Um, Gin Joint is about an establishment in um, Charleston. Gin Joint. After drinks and late conversations in predictable cadences that slip into that hour between days, we find King Street new with emptiness, the Atlantic breeze embellishing temperatures like a shawl. We are undifferentiated a group transpiring from shadows, minds content to make no problems, just as the cobbles that lay quietly shift time and hold no grudges against us. None of this has happened before, though the salty echoes of our voices spins an image of that city in the high desert, a former home for which tonight can be no anodyne. 
and I'll finish up with one more that I don't often read. Uh, Writers Conference. When you are away this long, I am prone to binge watch Frasier, exist on cereal for too many meals, vacuum at odd hours of the night, masturbate to your porn tapes on the couch. It's not like I have to resist these temptations when you are around. They aren't daydreams I keep to myself or write about in my journal. It's not as if I forget my intentions to finish that quilt, paint a landscape, generally do more writing, or get a leg up on lesson plans for the fall. It's just that those are always possibilities and that your absence, well, your absence insists on different routines. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that that QT poem made me realize how much I miss QT not being in Georgia and South Carolina, because you know what? You could always depend on a clean bathroom at a QT. Um, anyways, thank you so much for that reading, Lisa. Um, and next up is Gary Jackson. So Gary, I'm taking you back to an early interview. So when I was looking at different interviews and I saw one that was titled, maybe the poem doesn't give a shit. I was like, yeah. please let me find something. Easier. I just want to be able to say two times, maybe the poem doesn't give a shit while I'm doing your introduction. Uh, I'll be damned right off the bat. I really enjoyed something that you had to say at the beginning of the interview. Um, so I'm going to actually give the full, some info um, with the, interviewer said and then asked before I give your response so that it's very clear to everyone. William Carlos Williams wrote the poem as a complete little universe, much like the comics which you write about, Missing You, Metropolis, pair seemingly autobiograph autobiographical, I cannot talk, work with poems in the voice of or what follow comic book characters, especially those from the Marvel Universe, but Williams followed up his statement with this one. Any poem that has worth expresses the whole life of the poet. How does this universe of the comic books express your life? How does it temper with your own concerns? And this is what you had to say, and I really liked your answer. Last weekend, after forgetting a conversation we'd had at a friend's house, my wife asked me, how is it that you can forget so many things that just happened yesterday, but you can remember every little thing that happens in a comic? It's a question I faced before. I forget all kinds of shit, but for some reason, I can remember the details of a comic better than most other texts. I can't say why this is the case. Perhaps it was my way of coping, dealing with the world, the losses I accumulated over those years, or the fact that as a 10-year-old, I could read these X-Men comics, the Uncanny X-Men, alongside the amazing Spider-Man and the Incredible Hulk, were, the, were among the first comics I ever read, and immediately connected the dots between being a mutant and being different and being Black, and all these things I couldn't explain started making sense to me. Was it T.S. Eliot who said poetry could communicate before it's understood or some shit like that, right? Well, comets did that for me. And for whatever reason, they stuck with me, stick with me still. I'm not entirely sure why I still have boxes and boxes full of old comics in my closet that I'll probably never read, but I can't bear to sell. Why a panel of Spidey swinging out of his Soho apartment with his arm in a sling is such a strong memory for me. Why I'm still so goddamn attracted to the world of superheroes, despite the varying quality of the writing, the 90s, yikes. But I wouldn't say comics are the equivalent of my whole life. My 10 year old self would feel betrayed. They just serve a pretty damn good vehicle for me to explore the usual suspects, sex, race, loss, death, navigating the world and my place in it. And I think that's what comics have always done for the people who create them. Thank you for being here tonight. The screen is yours. Thank you so much, Dustin. <laughs> um, that was great. And that interview was like over 10 years ago, I feel like. So I have completely forgot everything about that interview except for the title. So thank you for bringing that back. Um, can everybody hear me okay too, by the way? Okay. 
I don't typically wear big headphones like this, but like Lisa said, we I anticipated maybe having people in and out of the house. So I've got these big noise canceling headphones on. So it makes my own voice sound like I have like a perpetual like cold or something right now, but hopefully I don't sound that bad. Um, so I'm going to read, um, I have two books um, that doesn't reference. I'll hold them up since I don't have like a fancy screen. So Missing Metropolis is one. Um, Origin Story is the second book that just came out last year. I'm actually just going to read one poem out of Origin Story because I um, posted on Instagram today that I was looking forward to this reading because I wanted to read new shit to, to use that theme of shit. Um, so now I have to kind of hold myself to that. So I'm just going to read one poem from origin story and I think it's a I think it might be a good poem to read because it kind of sums up a lot of what's going on in this collection so this poem takes place during kind of like a a pit stop my mother and I took when we were visiting her mother who lives in up in Virginia and um it was the first time my mother was meeting her mother again in person in about 20 years um, and I volunteered to like take her up there and kind of um, be her chauffeur. And she and my mother also reunited with her half sister, who she hadn't seen in maybe 40 years before that. This poem's called Alexandria. Box cars, scotch, cheap bourbon on rocks, nothing neat. We steady chasing love from ghosts over drinks half slung. Last night, your sister offered us money for making the long trip to visit. Then the two of you quizzed your mother on the names of the living and the dead and corrected every wrong answer. Your mother kept calling me your husband instead of your son. How can family be stranger the closer we become? We ain't slurring yet but well on our way. When you ask, do I remember your sister's name scrawled in the concrete in the backyard? Siri was here, 1968. And how the yard and the slab and the house got up and left us one day. And if you had more time, you would have burned the whole fucking city to the ground. You got me here so you wouldn't be lonely. So one day I could conjure your mother's voice, my one good trick. It's been 40 years since you spoke, mother, sister, last round. Let's swap another story in this shit Virginia bar without a single malt scotch. Grab a few tall boys for the nursing home. Your mother's lonely your sister's on her way thanks thanks everybody so i'm gonna read a couple new poems um and they all kind of reference a lot of what's going on in um missing you metropolis and origin story um so i'll just i'll just read it so this first poem is called it's just an obad and it's just simply titled a bod. And it's um and it and it's um about my friend Stuart, who I grew up with in Kansas. Originally, this poem was called The Trees, I want to say, and I still like that name. But Percival Everett has like an excellent novel called The Trees. And I know novels aren't copyrighted or you can't claim a title, but I I now I feel like I can't fucking use that title now because that novel's so good and so new. So Originally titled The Trees, but now a bod. Before I knew the difference between dirt and soil, before I knew how to water perennial grief, before the poems, there were two of us standing in the field. There, Stuart said, pointing to a branch, is where they found his body. Nothing there now but the faraway trees and the faraway birds, shapeless and black and fluttering in their bare branched homes and us. The body gone now, taken down and carried away. I can't recall if the field was real 
though I can still see it and us standing in it and facing the thicket of trees, too young to understand the future, staring back. And I'll tell you now what I never said then. I never cared for the dead boy. I've forgotten his name, but remember his chicken straw hair, thick glasses, how Kansan he looked, Midwest round. He played guitar well enough, taught us chords in his mother's basement, but I never could play for shit. It's a start, Stuart used to say, always reminding me I still had time to learn. It's messed up, I said, but why are we here? I was hungry. I was always hungry. But he ignored me and closed his eyes and took a breath because he still could. So I too closed my eyes and tried to conjure grace, but only saw the empty field, the growing grass, the spread of trees. Let's eat. Um, and then I'll read. So Lisa, like always, um, shames me with how good her poetry is, especially when it's about the two of us um, sharing a life. So she read this, she read a poem about um, how we raised, we raised, we were raising, still are raising pandemic chickens. Um, and it's such a, it was such a great poem. And then I realized I never write about chickens or a lot of things that we do in our house. And so I wrote this poem. Um, it's called Chickens. And it's a, it's a pretty new poem too. Chickens. Know when they're going to die. It's why she leaves the flock, lays beneath the magnolia bush while her sisters clamber into the coop for the evening. She hopes to spare them the trauma of watching her die. Instead, she presents herself only to us the next morning. Sure, I'm projecting a human trait, but imagine the horror of knowing you're walking into your own brutal death in the processing plant. It's no surprise, Lisa says, we're such fearful creatures, full on chicken wings and fried chicken sandwiches and sesame chicken and chicken salad and rotisserie chicken and barbecue chicken, chicken fingers, chicken pot pie, chicken parmesan, chicken and waffles. We're always eating fear. I swear I'll stop. Every time I look at our own small flock from our kitchen window, we're preparing Korean fried chicken. And why do I need to include that extra adjective when I tell you what I'm preparing? If I only said fried chicken, would you render me whole or only smell paper buckets and grease? Watch me lick the fat from my fingers over a plate of bones. The things I love will kill me and kill the ones I love. The chickens outside, Lisa and I, full on sweet, dark meat. And so now I'm going to um, shift to um, this, uh, just three more poems. And they're all kind of from this newer um, collection I'm working on that's about almost entirely about superheroes because as Dustin captured in that interview, I cannot let them go no matter what. And so um, these are all poems that revolve around kind of this like mainly a trio of superheroes of my like own creation. So there's no like Spider-Man or, or Batman in these poems. But but they all are very much kind of informed by by the the last forty years of comics and more that I've read. Um, I don't know which one to start with, so I'm gonna start with. Let's see. 
Okay, I'll, I'll read this one. This, it's simply called The Telepath Finds the Bright Side. Um, and the other thing that's kind of going on in the speculative world is that um, we now have like moons that are like artificial that orbit the planet, which is a whole other thing that I, that, in, that was informed by like a, an engineer in China was working on this. This is like a real thing this engineer wanted to do where they were going to launch moons into the sky to provide like additional light. Um, just they thought, I think, to make the streets safer and to provide like another source of like heat and light and make things safe. And it just seemed like such a weird and like sci-fi idea. Um, the last time I read about it, they were planning to do this in 2025, but I doubt I doubt it's going to happen at all. But I, I just kind of took that idea and just ran with it. So this poem is called The Telepath, if I can find it again. Um, bear with me, I have like 80 screens up. The Telepath Finds the Bright Side. When she looked to the sky, this is what she saw. Scores of children wired to artificial moons orbiting our world, batteries to last a lifetime. What she saw, made her scream, made her shout from her home, but we didn't listen. She tried broadcasting the truth directly into our minds, but we called it fake news. We weren't about to give up our lunar powered world full of free and wonderful light. Someone pointed at the telepath and said, isn't it past time we did something about them? And when someone said them, we knew what they meant. We sent her death threats, told her to keep her mouth shut. We streamed gasoline through the backyard garden, trampled the mums, huddled on the back porch and struggled with the match until the neighbors saw. When that failed, the direct approach. We brought torches and pitchforks, call us old fashioned, strapped on our guns and marched down the block under moonlight and knocked on the front door. She moved out, the neighbor said. Good riddance, we replied. We kissed our flags for good luck. Okay, I've already read a couple about the telepath, so let's see what else I can do. Um, I will read this poem that I I have this bad habit of like letting it's not a bad habit but I let the previous book inform like the current book so um I'm gonna read a poem called origin story that has absolutely nothing to do with the book titled origin story I feel like I should make that clear um but um this is in the voice of like one of the characters in this world and I'm pretty sure I know who it is but I kind of don't want to say because it might be a surprise when when I reveal whoever this is who's saying this. So this is called Origin Story. If I could take it back, trust that I would. I believe you when you tell me to go back where I came from. Oh, if I could. But I came from you. So let's not be mad that I'm always greeted by the murderers and the animal lovers who treat us like animals. The rally full of men demanding their country back. Let's start over. Do right by me and I'll leave you alone. All I want is a little peace. Otherwise, I'm trouble you can't shake. Every day you say it's us or you. Don't worry, I know exactly what you mean. America, I mean to be your first and second plane. And so I'll close with um, with this last poem, and it's just called History Month with the uh, with the actual um, community redacted. So you kind of insert your own History Month is the intention. Um, the, uh, the person uh, narrating this poem, I typically try not to say this, but, um, I feel like I probably should, but the, the person narrating this poem is a character called the Invincible Woman. 
And um, so far, all of her poems are in the second um, uh, um, second person perspective. So they're all you poems. So um, this is just a poem of her basically witnessing the superhero version of American Idol. History Month. The young boy on stage sings Amazing Grace. Each note turns into your saddest memory. Everyone is crying and applauding. The judge's table asks him the first question. Standing near the back of the crowd, your teammate calls him a, glorif a glorified scratch and sniff. He'll never make the cut. You punch him hard in the shoulder. Anytime one of you is on stage, it should be an occasion for joy. But he's not wrong. You both know it's all for show. None of these contestants will advance. They've already decided who will win. They told you that morning. Still, the night sky is breezy and cool, full of stars you can just make out this far from the stage. Your other teammate shows up with overpriced beers and asks what she missed. Nothing, your teammate says, but she can't hear him over the booze and groans. A young man turns water into Hennessy and takes a drink. You hold out your cigarette for your teammate to take and close your eyes, close the stars. The judges adjust the blank papers on their desks. She looks promising, your teammate says. You drink and watch the girl on stage bend down and lightly touch the cat's head, transforming him into a dying fish, then a lumbering bear, then a hawk that takes flight and is off before anyone can applaud, before anyone realizes it's never coming back. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Before I introduce our final reader of the evening, I'm gonna give a plug one more time. Our next reading is on the 16th. Josh Davis, Danielle Doolin, and Jessica Walsh will be reading. If you like to say Facebook events because they link to your calendar and remind you on Facebook, there's the Facebook link um, for that event on the 16th. I am gonna ask our final reader of the evening to unmute. Jason B. Crawford. And Jason, I have two different things that I'm going to do for your introduction. Um, I love Donna Voyer and she does great reviews and she did a review of um, Jason's book, Year of the Unicorn Kids. And I'd actually like to read um, part of what she wrote about your book as your intro. And then I have something from an interview that I wanna share because again, couldn't make up my mind. And then since I run the show, I can always just do what I want. So thanks for being here. And I hope everyone enjoys this. This is what Donna had to say. Unicorns have long been the stuff of legend, whether adorning the tapestries of medieval Europe or prancing across a Lisa Frank trapper keeper covered in rainbows and glitters, unicorns are usually described in two ways, magical and rare. Magic is elusive though, it requires both belief and doubt, which makes it dangerous and sometimes disappointing. And rare things hold a different kind of worth. Their unique and singular value is something to hold on to, if, even if only for a brief moment. In their collection, Year of the Unicorn Kids, Jason B. Crawford chronicles a life infused with the magic of the sensual. As the body breaks and opens in these lines, they expose the pleasures and sins of the body as something rare and beautiful. These poems are odes to the body in all its forms, as lover, as sacrifice, as vessel, as contrition, as repulsion, as abandon, as rebellion, as something magical and rare. So there was an interview that you did in January 2021 um, and I just really fucking love what you had to say in this answer. So um, the person, so, so many of your poems are about community, family, friends, 
running around cookouts, how do you balance that existing and community and network and interdependence and that independence that I'm here for myself? And this is what you had to say. It truly boils down to who I write for, which is me. If I write a poem about my friends, it's still for me. I use this to make sure I'm always saying what I need to say. I invite others into the space all the time, but they just have to be aware that they're a guest and I will not change my home to appease them. Thank you so much for being here tonight. The screen is yours. Oh my God, Dustin, thank you. Oh, I love this. Uh, I really needed this reading tonight, um, more than you know, and um, not even for me to read, but like just to listen and be in space. And I really appreciate it um, because I am a huge fan. Uh, I'm gonna read um, my comic book poem that is in my book, uh, Beast Boy. What animal will you transfix into today? Gaping hole fully ajar, teeth strapping from your gums as you smile skin crawling into a new shape. You will hide in all this. Your friends know you, all green and musk, tongue dragging from the side of your lip, a body full of bodies with more fur. And what is it to you to assume the identity of another thing? You've been playing dress up your entire life. I say you change animal because the rest of the world won't believe what we do is human. So we must be beast, boy. Um, so that's from my debut full length collection, You're the Unicorn Kids out from Sundress. Um, I did a whole tour with this book, so I'm not going to read out of it. Other than that, I just really wanted to read that poem. Um, I did have a poem just come out in Beloit. Uh, I didn't know it was actually out, out until like this book showed up at my door. So I, um, I really wanted to talk about, I'm still working on this. It's, it's you know, it's growing theory. Um, blackness and taught aggression um especially from fathers and uh mainly from my father and uh I use the the vessel of basketball and basketball teams because I played basketball for a very long time in my life um you know back in my mask days so I'm gonna read this one uh three man weave learning to braid and since we are talking about braiding Nothing bound the team tighter than a three-man weave, traveling the full length of the court without traveling and without ever dropping the ball, a scoop pass perfectly placed in the pocket of the teammate's elbow. As you fold behind him, the pill never really leaves the middle of the floor, movement stitched in between three players, a continuous backdoor cut, staying in sync, Dishing again and again and again until it's your turn to drop the layup at the basket and effortlessly someone grabs the rebound before the rock touches the ground and you weave back the same way you just came somehow even though Eric is the fastest on the team and you took the wing spot and so did Eddie and you know you are the slowest of the group, but this, but you keep pace and Eric is childish, but also only 12 and you're only 13 and slow, but a good shooter, not fast enough to stay with him on a fast break like that one time he stutter stepped and you fell and everyone laughed at your broken ankles including your father who joked basketball is a standing sport you know if you miss a dime or an underhand it means the whole team might run and this is the first team you've ever been a part of so you try your hardest to not make any mistakes on this drill you are so perfect 
the floor becomes three swift channels of water pushing currents the length of the hardwood and your father has nothing to yell at you about this time because for once you didn't fuck up the drill for once you didn't fuck up um so I'm in an MFA program. Actually, I think, uh, yeah, one of my uh, cohort members is in here, uh, Lopu, amazing writer, love you. Um, and I've been writing uh, a new Afrofuturistic style manuscript uh, about the exploration of Black flight or Black people leaving towards space um, to escape what America is or the world is um and it's pretty much like halfway done mostly done like it's mostly done it's a lot of edits now um but I want to read from that because uh this project really excites me um however I I feel like I want to read the sad poems out of it because you know it's get sad girl summer even though it's fall uh but it also talks a lot about like how much I just dislike this country so let's start there my country is a dumb bird, thrashing itself into a window, its bony flapping lens, a veiny gushing red down the side. Could this be a massacre of beauty, love for one's own property, a way to catch the bird on the other side of the mirror, its elegant wings fluttering back, a haunting. But there's nothing on the other side of this thin sheet of glass, no new face smudging the reflective surfaces. I fear my body, like my country, is learning this violent flight. Will stick its full beak into a rippling puddle to see how long it can drown before it drowns. I do not query death, it just happens. It keeps happening. I see my body and its bullets and its barrel and its hunters and its reverber reverberation clearing a whole field of doves. Um, yeah, when I started writing more into this, I, um, I moved to New York uh, for this program. Uh, I also th thought about how lonely it is to leave a space that you've never, you know, that you're used to, um, and that would be included in moving off this planet. So um, this book also, or this manuscript also really um, frames a lot of the poems as um, theories or uh, quizzes or things like that. So it's almost, if you don't know if you're speaking from the future or the past, if it's someone um, giving you the theory of when they left or uh, someone making the theory of what could be. So this is the exhaust exhaustion theory for Jojo after feeling all right. I watched a couple braid their hands on the A train, not sure if they gripped each other so tightly because of their fear of the other pretty human sitting next to them. The city lacks the space for me to yell or sing at my loudest shrill when I am lonely. How likely they are to confuse my sadness for exhaustion if I let them, if I never say a word. There is an echo I wish to own, midnight air in Ypsilanti parking lots, contender this sweet to my tongue. Too often I think about grief, once I had a home built of gingerbread sticks. Once I wasn't afraid of the coins slipping through my clasping pockets of fingers. Once in a poem I wrote, I understand leaving and around me, everything appeared. Loose hinged doorways ready for my spilling. Sometimes I create a list of things I cannot do just to feel a little more like I'm not supposed to save this country. Sometimes I want a hand to hold like a hummingbird destined to escape my bird cage palms. Sometimes I pretend to cry at the safest part of the movies. 
Sometimes the credits roll and the lights dawn and I'm still in the front row weeping uncontrollably. Um, I'm gonna read two more uh, and then, you know, jump on out. Uh, these last two are, well, one's sad, one's not. Um, so let's, let's end on the not sad one. So we, we'll go, you know, let's go Wednesday. Um, this has no self, this is just how I think. So sometimes my job is just to notice. I start every story with just looking, what I can touch, who I cannot, take a survey of the room, question who is alive, who might be a figment of my false reality. Often, I do not believe someone is dead until I call them and they do not answer. When I was a child, I thought everyone was dead until they appeared in front of me, risen from the grave, unholy trinity of staying, what vast variance I've created for myself through the learning of deadness. I find a dead hen in a pond knee deep in ice and panic. I'm not sure the protocol of dead things, so I do not touch it. I answer every text message back within seconds just to prove my existence. I ignore every call I receive from a number I wish to think I've passed away. My ex fiance was alive until she was not and was again breathing. If I call her, she would not respond. Does this make her dead again in my mouth? I speak incantations of survival. Let my grandfathers be okay when he misses the phone. Let my sister be okay when she forgets to text back. Even my father, whom I do not call, I pray for his well being. Check the news, search his name in Toledo papers. My mother texts me every morning just to let me know she is alive just to prove to herself she is not a ghost. I answer her every text and sometimes she does not respond. I wait the rest of the day for her eulogy. Um, so last poem, uh, and I wanna say thank you. Thank you, Lisa, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Dustin, for inviting me. Um, I. I'm thrilled. So um, I wanted to think about old language and new language, what we would lose in the new world and what we have to keep as uh, as Black people. So uh, this one's for my friend Chris Butler, um, poet from Philly, living out in Canada. Translations of an ancient text for Chris L. Butler. In the new world, we still say John noun as in the spot, noun the lick, noun the good good, noun the what I need at the moment, verb as in the words I forget are special until I am holding them in, again in my arms. In the new world, we still say we done, noun as in inevitable, verb as in never question our mother's capable hands, verb as in the way she breaks the chicken at the joint, severs the spine, always finds enough to, for two meals in one split bone. In the new world, we retired the word noun cop and noun verb police and noun prison and verb remain silence and verb silencing a list of words no longer needed to govern us like noun government or noun president or noun whiteness. In the new world, we still say, what's good, G? Noun, as in, hello, my love. I cannot name love in public. Verb, as in, I'm here for you to talk or not talk about it all, verb, as in, let me unfold the table of my palms and bring sweet fruit to your mouth. Adjective, as in, I am choosing to ungroom this tongue for you. Blessed boy, running from his own chalk shadow. Adjective, as in, I am sorry, I do not have more to spare. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, and thank everybody for being here. So this series only works if I invite people and they say yes. Um, and people say yes, even with my mouth, because y'all know I have no filter. So thank you for always saying yes. And thank you for always showing up. I'm very appreciative of everyone who takes time out of their schedule to be here in the audience. And as a reader, I'm just going to drop the link one more time because you can find the schedule through our link tree. Um, again, we have readings through the end of the year, but also there's already readings booked next year. I'm just waiting to do a graphic for those, but if you go to the website, you'll see them. There's already readings booked in January, February, and March, um, and stuff coming out for April. So please feel free um, to retweet and share anything on Facebook, um, and just give, you know, a general shout out to the series. If you enjoyed tonight, just, you know, do a tweet, do a Facebook post. Really love that Wild and Precious Life series. You should give it a try. Word of mouth goes a long ways. So again, thank you everyone for being here tonight, and with that, we are going to hit end on this Zoom. Have a great night, everybody. Be safe.